Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post-commentary on the missions that were conducted during the live stream on November 22nd. Just a reminder, this is all in the Realism Overhaul set of mods for Kerbal Space Program, so we're operating on Earth in the real solar system. The full mod list is in the video description. The first thing I wanted to do during this live stream was to check out new configurations for our Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, Aeronym was good enough to add the version 1.2 configurations for the Merlin 1D engines and uh, so I wanted to check those out. That is an upgrade that SpaceX is doing and the first version 1.2 will be launching in December I believe. Uh, here I am creating a Jupiter probe and so of course we need RTGs and you can see me putting them on that arm there. And of course, we want that arm to just extend to 90 degrees. That's in an Inferno Robotics arm. And uh, so, yeah, the problem with uh, putting RTGs like that is the center mass tends to lean one way. I also wanted to put a survey scanner so that once we get to Jupiter, we can do some scans, hopefully, if we have enough delta V to get to a moon or so. Uh, but of course, you can't put it on the side like that, so I have to put the scanner on top and put the communication dish on the side. Still, you can see the center of mass issue as we extend the RTG booms, so I have to put the RTGs like that, which is a little bit easier to manage. And we only need needed two of them it looked like, though fuse box might be fooling with me on that. Uh, so I continue to build the probe. Um, the next engine was a lunar module descent engine, I believe, and then I tried to put a stage of RL-10s. The problem is that we were rapidly getting too large for the Falcon 9, and we were getting into Falcon 9 heavy territory. You can see, uh, oh, I've replaced the uh, Lunar Module Descent Engine with an Estes Engine, which has a little bit better ISP. And now I'm aiming for a Venus Probe, which will be a little bit more the size that Falcon 9 can handle. Falcon 9 Heavy can do a Jupiter Probe. Falcon 9 itself is more Venus or Mars it can handle, as far as probes are concerned. This is a little lander for Venus. And so you see I've got RCS thrusters for it to maneuver around and I'm going to put it below the main probe which has the communication dish. This is a redesigned probe for Venus. We don't need RTGs for Venus, we can use solar panels and that'll be a little bit lighter. And so here we have the Venus probe on top of its lander. And the lander with its heat shield, communications. So the lander will communicate with the, with the orbiting communication array. The orbiting communication array has the survey scanner and all of that. Now this can fit on a Falcon 9, so that serves my purpose of wanting to test out the Falcon 9 with the new configurations. Now in theory the, the um, plumes were fixed, uh, especially if you remember in previous videos we had a problem with the upper stage plume. Uh, I hate to say it, but it turns out that the plumes have not been fixed here, so I will end up using completely different engines in future episodes. Somebody in the YouTube comments suggested a different engine pack with better plumes and just a better model for the engines and I'll probably using that though that probably means that the, the lag will be increased because the engines are more sophisticated looking but we'll see alright so Falcon 9 is off aiming for Venus the Venus transfer time and Jupiter transfer time are about the same time that's why I was able to jump from launching a Jupiter probe into launching a Venus probe it was like just a couple of days difference we will still launch a Jupiter probe, but we'll have to down a Falcon Heavy and I want to test the engines. So here we go, first stage out. And second stage, you can see that the plume is not fixed yet. By the way, I did create a special save uh, during that first stage so that I could do recovery testing of the first stage. So I'll look forward to doing that at some other time, though I haven't gotten to it yet. Here is fairing separation and our little probe there. So as far as the actual mission is concerned, all is going well, and 10 I are out. But one problem was that Fusebox was lying to me. We don't have quite enough electric charge, and that's going to cause complications. But here we go. Also, there's the issue that the... It might not have been completely lying to me. The problem is also that the, the lander... I couldn't turn off the lander core. You know, it has a probe core on it, and that's taking up juice. Here we have second stage out. Separation. We are in orbit. The periapsis above 130 kilometers. So we are ready to go. 
But yeah, um, so here I am trying to turn off that uh, the lander's probe core. It does have a toggle power, but I don't think that's what I think it means. So yeah, that's that's a bit of an issue. Anyway, we do have a Venus encounter. It was pretty easy to uh, make that happen. 3,455 prograde and then just a trivial amount. Uh, well, a small amount uh, in a normal direction in order to get really close to Venus here. You could get the encounter without doing the radial and normal burn, but to get really close like I'm doing right here, you need to do those extra tweaks. It doesn't add too much to the total burn, because the prograde vector is so much more. Okay, so here we're setting the fuel down, and that is an RL-10. And off we go. Now at this point I still have hope about the power situation because our solar panels aren't really facing the sun properly and also we are going closer to the sun on the way to Venus so we'll be getting more and more energy from our solar panels. So those that's all contributing to uh, hope that this will still work out. Here we go midway through the burn and then finally close to the end of the burn here. Alright, engine shut down, and unfortunately I left Smart ASS on node, so it started rotating, that's not good. Probably threw us off. I mean, you saw the tweak to get the orbit close to Venus was pretty, pretty fine-tuned, and yeah, I had to do a lot of maneuvering afterwards to fix it up because of that little spin, and also because we were a little bit off anyway. The burns aren't instantaneous like uh, the maneuvers expect them to be. So we had to do this correction burn. Not too hefty. And of course the RL-10 has relights. Okay, after some RCS correction, we bring the orbit down as close as we wanted it to be. Now I don't have clouds, obviously, so Venus doesn't look the way you see it in the pictures. That's the scorched surface of Venus, rather than the cloudy uh, view that you normally have. So yeah, that, that's our probe headed to Venus. And, well, as far as the power situation, I'll get to that in a later episode. But not for now, we are launching probes. We are not going to be having them reach their target in this episode. The next one is Jupiter. And so I take full advantage of the fairing size on the Falcon Heavy. And the reason that the tanks are sized in that awkward way is because, and since they're sized as lozenges, basically, I gave them fancy colors like that. But the idea is that I want to fill the fairing up as much as possible and uh, we have a limited fairing size to work with. You can see my little RCS blocks on those little things that contain the monomethyl hydrazine and N2O4. I added on there. The, the actual tanks have liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. So anyway, here we are with Falcon Heavy now and ignition. <laughs> Engines running, all 27, and boy was this laggy, and launch. So this time I think I have fuel cross feeding in. Yeah, you can see that the uh, 18 engines are depleting their kerosene faster than the, the, other, the other 9 on the core. As far as recovering the core stage, by the way, I think the best way to do it is if they launch out of Brownsville and land the core at Cape Canaveral. Uh, if it's launching directly across the Atlantic, the way, best way to retrieve the core is probably just by having it land on the barge. Trying to bring it back to Cape Canaveral as you've seen in some of their promotional videos. Uh, I, I don't see that working out very well. But I don't know, they might have done other calculations. Anyway, we're about to have booster separation in well, about one second. There we go. By the way, the separation rockets and the decouplers are all part of the last tech pack, so I haven't tweaked those. I don't know exactly where to put the separation boosters and how many I should be putting on, but anyway, it tends to work out. I should mention, by the way, that the realism overhaul configuration for this LASTEC pack does put nitrogen 
in the in the first stage and the booster stage, you know, the same structure, and that's for its RCS. The problem is that they use the structural fuel tank type, and here we have four stage separation and ignition of the second stage. So they use this core stage, uh, the structural fuel tank type, and the problem is that in real fuels, the structural fuel tank type can't take nitrogen, so the nitrogen doesn't show up. So in later episodes, I will have edited the real fuels configuration for the structural fuel tank type so that I can accept nitrogen, and then the nitrogen shows up. So I have done that uh, after this episode. So that means that the RCS is able to maneuver those stages, and then we can uh, recover them if we wanted to. It's a little bit more realistic anyway. Okay, so engine out, and we are in orbit, a little bit high on the apoapsis, but not bad and uh, trying to hit Jupiter, which is really easy to hit, of course. Uh, so no, no huge problem trying to get the probe to Jupiter. The trick is to get it close enough to one of the moons so that we could potentially get into orbit around that moon. Uh, I, I don't think we're going for orbit this time. The delta V on the probe is not enough. We're looking at a 6,000 meter per second transfer, and we have only 7,000... No, I think maybe one of the ta tanks is still locked. I'll have to review that. But anyway, we're uh, using another burn of the upper stage of the Falcon 9. And that'll give us about a thousand, look like about a thousand three hundred meters per second or so. And then we'll separate and then we will have the RL-60 vacuum engine, which is a further development on the RL-10. The benefit of the RL-60 is that it has many more ignitions. Uh, not necessary in this case, but it also has a slightly higher ISP than most versions of the RL-10. And it has a good high thrust too. It's a more or less an RL-10B2 with some perks. So on we go, and almost out on this stage. That stage is out. Still quite a lot of burning to do. Separation and RL-10 ignition. Okay, so we do have the probe's on stage that's still locked. So that's good, because we'll need that fuel to try and get into orbit around one of those moons of Jupiter if we're going to do the survey scanner. But getting into orbit around those moons is very difficult. You talk about thousands of meters per second of delta V, 5,000, 6,000, that kind of thing. Anyway, we have 1,174 1, meters per second left in this stage, but that's not going to do us any good because the hydrogen or oxygen are going to boil off by the time we get to Jupiter. So we really don't need that fuel. Uh, well, we're not going to have that fuel anyway. So any correction we can do early on would be best. Uh, and here I have a correction to aim us for Callisto. And Callisto is good because we won't be going too fast as we pass by Callisto. Uh, maybe we'll be able to match speeds a little bit better. It would be possible to uh, do a burn to get into orbit around Jupiter first. That doesn't take that much. And then hit one of the moons. That might be a little bit better. Here I am checking out how much delta V we need to get into orbit around Callisto. And you can see it's quite a lot. Yep. Yeah, that, that orbit isn't isn't bending at all. Okay, well, it looks like maybe my theory that Callisto was a good idea might not be correct. We're talking about 8,000. Well, it's not in the right place there. Still, uh, 8,000. Maybe one of the heavy ones like uh, Ganymede might be good. But here we're talking about 8,300 on top of, and that's about as close as, well, we're crashing into Callisto right there. So we can't get any closer. Anyway, so I queue up the correction burn at least, and we're not guaranteed to get this close pass to Callisto anyway. I also get rid of the transfer reminders for Jupiter and Venus since we now have probes destined for each one. I take the Jupiter probe out into interplanetary space and that sufficiently messes up the, the Callisto encounter, as you might expect. 
Uh, you always- oh, you know the no connection, and that's because I've locked the battery on the probe core. And so the, um, the electric charge isn't running. And that's because I think Fusebox really messed with me this time, because we've got RTGs on this thing, there's no excuse. Anyway, I recreate the, the um, correction burn for Callisto. And, uh, yep, we will have to do that. I don't quite remember what I'm trying to do here. Maybe trying to unlock the battery? It's tough to select those little probe cores for some reason. I don't know why. You can see it's not highlighting them. Anyway, this is the Venus probe. And we have connection and everything here. Um, as far as power goes, though, not great. So, uh, th this might cause problems later because... Uh, well, I, I won't give it away. Next episode, we have trouble with the Venus probe. But I wonder if I locked the battery on it or not. Anyway, here we have our Venus encounter as planned after bringing it out into interplanetary space. So that's all well and good, and I can just get that there. Next order of business is the Jupiter correction burn. And you notice, I think we lost like maybe 900 meters per second of delta V on boil off because we lost so much liquid hydrogen and that, was, that came as quite a surprise since it wasn't that long and so I don't know why we lost that much delta V it was really disconcerting and so we actually had to use some of the well I, I'm here using the Arizean N204 from the little t RCS tanks on that stage first but we're gonna have to move on to the next stage to continue this burn I wonder if that's a descent engine or ascent engine. Uh, it's either the... I think that's the lunar module ascent engine, but we'll see in a sec. I'm talking about the next stage here. They both use Arizine and N204 as well. Uh, unfortunately, smart ASS. Uh, well, I've got the time warp on. I've got 3x physical time warp. That's why it's wiggling around so much. Uh, hopefully, I'll fix that. But another complication is that we have a signal delay here. I've already pressed uh, for staging, but here you see me going to flight computer and staging is going to take two more seconds. And then we'll have engine ignition. Okay, that is the ascent engine, which has less thrust and also does not have gimbling, that's important. So uh, three seconds left before that stage fires. Okay, and we have stage ignition on the lunar module ascent engine completing this burn. After that we have uh, plenty more delta V, though I don't think we have 8,000 meters per second. You can see there's this stage and then there's the stage with the 1 kN thrusters on top of it. So that's a lot. Uh, our problem now is electric charge, which we clearly do not have enough of. Well anyway, that settles the Jupiter transfer burn. Did I have to make any corrections? Well, it was pretty close. Uh, let's take a closer look at Jupiter here. Well, it's too close if we wanted to hit Callisto, but it didn't look like we had enough fuel to get into orbit around Callisto anyway. So I think I leave it just there and aim to hit one of the other moons instead. Okay, so here I'm checking up on our station and making sure it has supplies through most of the business that I intend to do. And you see, we can transfer quite a lot of probes to many different planets. In, while the station is still remaining well supplied, this, of course, is a Pluto probe. And you can tell because it has a really big dish. And we need it for really extended communications. Obviously, RTGs. This time, I do not skimp. I put six, oh no, eight, eight RTGs. So, definitely enough charge on this one. And you can see the arms have another stage to fit in between them. I decided not to use an RL-10 for this because, well, first of all, we don't we that boil off was pretty spectacular, and second of all, the fuel for the SS engine, the hypergolic fuels, are denser, so they fit a little bit better between those two RTG arms. So uh, here, though, we have uh, RL-10, and so we're going to have to burn all of the fuel from this stage in orbit around Earth, otherwise it's going to boil off too quickly. So we can't wait around. And then we have uh, RL-60 stage here, uh, five of them, which is still uh, half the thrust of a J-2, and they have better efficiency. Uh, now this is a, a Saturn 1C, which means we have a J-2 in the place of the RL-10s on the second stage. Uh, it's J-2X. 
and uh, here I am trying to tweak the size of the tanks to optimize my Delta V. Initially we had 23,000 but uh, by tweaking the tanks and making the SS1 shorter we end up with uh, 25,000 meters per second without the fairings on right now. It'll drop to less than that with the fairings on. But yep, yeah, 25,356 meters per second. We're trying to get to Pluto with that. No gravity assist. Remember that uh, New Horizons got a gravity assist uh, at Jupiter. This is not having gravity assist. Uh, the side effect of that is that this one has a much longer transfer time. It's not going to take 15 years to get there or anything like that. It's going to take much longer. So that's a huge downside along with the fact that we have to use a much larger rocket to boost it up. But anyway, here we go. The SLS Block 1C performing spectacularly. This was a lot longer a launch than uh, it seems like from here. This is uh, sped up by four times. Here I'm waiting for the boosters to go to 400 kilonewtons before separating. You can't wait for them to go out completely, it'll take too long. And they're just extra dead weight during that time, not producing enough thrust, so we drop them off there. And on with the four RS-25s, the space shuttle main engines that are at the bottom of the SLS. Here I note one of the reasons why I might be having lag. <laughs> A huge, huge block of no reference exceptions. Uh, uh, so some mods are not playing well with other mods. And that's what's going on there. Not a surprise because I've deleted so many things and tweaked so many things. Uh, by now it's probably quite a mess. So yeah, that's probably... I'll try and work on that to tr try and figure out what exactly is causing the problem, but it's tough to say. Right. It's gotta be something that's running all the time, like real fuels or a firm aerospace. Uh, not something specific to one part. But anyway, here we go. Okay, that engine is out. Separation. And ignition of the J2X. And fairing separation. Uh, J2X has a six minute burn ahead of it, pushing this very heavy payload. This payload is much heavier than this rocket is really designed for, I think, and so our trajectory is not ideal. You can see I have to keep the pitch well above the prograde vector for an extended period of time. As you might expect, because the payload was too heavy and we had this inefficient trajectory, the J2X was not able to bring us all the way to orbit and we had to use some of the fuel from the payload in order to uh, finish the orbit off. The RL-60s now burning to bring us to a periapsis above 130 kilometers here. Uh, that took a little bit more than 400 meters per second I believe. So not the greatest situation but we did have 15,000 meters per second to use and so that's a good thing. We'll still deliver more than 15,000 meters per second to orbit. The total amount of mass delivered to orbit I believe will exceed 120 tons. Let's see. Okay, engine shut down 121 tons. So that's pretty good considering this is uh, basically equivalent to a SLS Block 1B which is not rated for that kind of payload. Anyway, uh, we have a trajectory to Pluto, but you can see uh, we are at the worst possible timing as far as inclination is concerned. We would really like to be burning out of the ascending or descending node. Instead, we're 90 degrees away from the ascending and descending node. So it is the worst possible situation, and we have to do a mid-course correction in order to actually hit Pluto. And of course, hitting Pluto at all is very difficult. It's a tiny little thing. And we're aiming from a very, very distant position. Uh, so I'm tweaking it here, but it looks like 8,000 for the initial transfer and then 6,250 or so for the mid-course adjustment. Somebody suggested that I try MechJeb, and so uh, here I go with the lowest delta V transfer from MechJeb, but you see departure in one year. We can't do that because the fuel will boil off. But even then it doesn't give an actual encounter there. It doesn't have it quite right. Um, so I fiddle around with it. Uh, obviously this is not going to work at all. Note the transit duration 59 years. It's not going to be a very easy way to deal with that 
considering where we have to burn out of because we have to go past in order to hit it. Uh, so I try and uh, create a node myself, uh, picking a point, and there we do have an encounter even. So that's pretty good. And that only costs 12,249. Unfortunately, it takes 30 days. And again, with the fuel boil off situation, that might be a problem because we're gonna lose. Well, even uh, if the fuel boil-off worked normally, because I think there was something wrong here. But the normal boil-off, after a month, is about 10%. And so you talk about losing 10% of your, uh, not of your delta V, of the fuel. And so more than 10% of the delta V. So it would probably be down to about uh, 14,000 meters per second or less. So that's not great. So not very great to wait around, but... The alternative is the other burn I applauded, which is 14,500 meters per second, which is more than I expect to boil off normally. So there's your trade-off for you. But we do have the situation where the boil off seems to be more than I'm expecting. Uh, oh, I point out there that we're actually in 1951, so it's not too bad uh, to have a 50-year transfer. But I leave it here at this point because I'm not too sure what, what to do, whether to go with the MechJeb plot or my own. And so with that, I'll say thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.